expansion of the universe that we now see. So it's what, what people call dark energy. The original Big Bang has shockingly been modified. We can find evidence from the last minute or so of inflation imprinted on our observable universe when inflation stops and the hot Big Bang follows. But nothing from before then is visible to us. There is no evidence for a universe before then, despite the claims of one of the most well-known living physicists. Now, as the James Webb Space Telescope astounds the globe, Nobel laureate Roger Penrose, famous for his research on black holes, claims that we can now view the full scale of the universe. In what ways might this discovery affect the universe? What is our place in the vastness of the cosmos? Join us as we explore how the James Webb Space Telescope deepens a major debate over the universe's expansion rate. When we step back from our human-centric viewpoint, we realize that our once overwhelming metropolis is, in fact, a dot on an inconsequential rock among countless others. By comparing our star to the size of the entire universe, we find that there are more stars like it than there are grains of sand on Earth. We live in a universe that formed from a hotter, denser, and more uniform past. This theory, known as the Hot Big Bang, was one of the most significant scientific achievements of the last hundred years. It was shockingly validated in the mid-1960s with the discovery of the primeval fireball that remained from that early, hot and dense state. Today known as the cosmic microwave background, this was initially suggested as a serious alternative to some of the more mainstream explanations for the expanding universe. The Big Bang Theory, which postulates an early inflationary era as the foundation for the Big Bang, has been the de jure explanation for how the universe came to be for over half a century. While astronomers and astrophysicists have persistently questioned both cosmic inflation and the Big Bang, each time new, crucial observations have been presented the alternatives have gradually faded into oblivion. Even 2020, Nobel laureate Roger Penrose's attempted alternative, conformal cyclic cosmology, cannot match the inflationary Big Bang's successes. Contrary to many years of headlines and Penrose's continued assertions, we see no evidence of a universe before the Big Bang. The density fluctuations imprinted in the cosmic microwave background gave birth to the stars, galaxies, and other large-scale structures in the universe today. These fluctuations originated from the quantum fluctuations inherent to space, which were stretched over the universe during cosmic expansion. This is the most complete model of the universe's behavior that we can currently construct, with inflation occurring before and setting the stage for the Big Bang. Regrettably, the data contained within our cosmic horizon is the only data that we have access to. This data is all within the same fraction of a location where inflation halted around 13.8 billion years ago. Assuming that space, time, matter, and energy all originated with the Big Bang is a typical way to portray it. This makes perfect sense when viewed through a specific antiquated lens. It follows that the universe was once smaller and denser than it is now if it is expanding and becoming less dense. If the universe contains radiation, such as photons, then the wavelength of that radiation will increase as the universe expands, indicating that it was hotter at the beginning of time and is now cooler. When one extrapolates far enough into the past, the density, temperature, and energy levels reach a position where a singularity can be created. For very small distances, very short periods, or very high energy scales, the principles of physics don't hold. When we rewind the clock by around 13.8 billion years to the legendary zero point, the Planck time, which is around 10 to 43 seconds, the laws of physics begin to collapse. We would anticipate a great deal of historical transition if this picture of the universe were correct, that it started out hot and dense and then expanded and cooled. When the temperature drops too low to sustain the creation of new particles and antiparticles, the surplus would be destroyed by radiation. Four basic forces and particles with non-zero rest masses are produced when the electroweak and Higgs symmetries collapse as the universe cools below the energy point at which they are restored. 
As the cosmos cools and expands, it changes from a neutral state, where photons can pass through, to one where free electrons and protons can collide. The initial detection of this cosmic radiation background occurred in the mid-1960s, quickly elevating the Big Bang theory to the sole data-consistent explanation for the beginning of our universe. The majority of astronomers and astrophysicists promptly accepted the Big Bang theory, but the leading alternative steady-state theorists, such as Fred Hoyle, continued to come up with increasingly ridiculous arguments to support their debunked theory in the face of mountainous evidence. Each concept, however, was a resounding failure. It was not exhausted starlight, reflected light, or heated and radiating dust. No matter how many theories were put forth, the evidence always proved them wrong. The cosmic afterglow spectrum was too uniform in all directions, too perfect a black body, and too uncorrelated with the stuff in the universe to fit any of these other models. Hoyle and his ideological supporters fought to impede scientific advancement by promoting scientifically impossible alternatives, even as the scientific community progressed to the Big Bang as a consensus. By the time the contrarians died, their research program had come to a halt and their trivially wrong work had faded into oblivion, but science had. During this time, astronomy and astrophysics as a whole experienced phenomenal growth from the 1960s through the 2000s, with cosmology as a subfield seeing the most remarkable expansion. We found a vast cosmic web and laid out the universe's structure on a grand scale. We learned about the formation evolution and dynamical evolution of galaxies and the star populations within them. We discovered that the known types of matter and energy in the universe couldn't account for all the things we see. Thus, we need dark matter and dark energy. Additionally, we confirmed other Big Bang predictions, including the predicted light element abundances, the existence of primordial neutrinos, and the finding of density imperfections of the specific type needed for the universe's formation into its observed large-scale structure. However, there were facts that could not be explained by the Big Bang, despite their veracity. Despite claims that the early universe experienced these arbitrarily high energies and temperatures, we have not been able to detect any exotic remnants, like magnetic monopoles, particles from grand unification, topological defects, etc. If the universe we see couldn't be explained by what we know, then something else must exist. But if it did, it has remained hidden from us. At its inception, the universe had to have a precise expansion rate that balanced the total energy density to within a few tenths of a percent if it was to have the characteristics we observe today. This fact remains unexplained by the Big Bang Theory. Additionally, for various parts of space to have a uniform temperature, thermal equilibrium, i.e., the ability to interact and exchange energy, must be present. But there are too many vast, expanding parts of the universe for any one causal relationship to exist. Such interactions would not have been possible, even at light speed. This is a huge problem for the scientific community and cosmology specifically. There are two paths open to scientists when they encounter occurrences that their existing theories fail to account for. Theoretically, we can try to explain these phenomena in a way that builds on previous work while also adding new predictions that are different from what came before. Alternatively, we could think that everything is as it seems and that the universe just came into being with the characteristics that make it what it is today. Even if the first strategy doesn't work, it's still worth trying because only the first one has any scientific merit. Cosmic inflation has been the most effective theoretical framework for postulating an elongated Big Bang. This framework postulates an earlier stage of the universe's exponential expansion, during which it was flattened, endowed with uniform properties everywhere, expanded at a rate proportional to its energy density, wrote off any remnants of past high-energy events, and predicted the emergence of quantum fluctuations, which would cause a unique kind of density and temperature fluctuations, on top of an otherwise uniform universe. A lot of people didn't like inflation, but it worked when everything else failed, just like the Big Bang did. It finds a solution to the graceful exit problem, 
which is the question of how a universe that is growing at an exponential rate can change into one that is expanding at a rate consistent with our observations. That is, how it can recreate all the achievements of the initial Big Bang. Any remnants of extremely high energy levels are eradicated as it imposes an energy cutoff. It produces a very homogeneous universe with a total energy density and expansion rate that are in perfect agreement. Additionally, it provides new predictions for the structures that should form and the first temperature and density fluctuations that should manifest, predictions that have now been confirmed to be accurate by measurements. The predictions of inflation were mainly made in the 1980s, and observational evidence supporting them has been slowly coming in over the last 30 years. There are many alternatives, but none of them work as well as inflation. Inflation never ends everywhere at once. Rather, it continues in discrete, independent zones separated by space, which is why many separate universes are projected to be produced in an expanding space-time. No two universes will ever collide, and this is the scientific basis for the idea of a multiverse. Instead of expanding into anything, the universe is expanding. Roger Penrose, a Nobel laureate, has devoted a great deal of time and energy in recent years to a crusade to discredit inflation. However, his pet idea, a conformal cyclic cosmology, or CCC, is a significantly less scientifically sound alternative to inflation. Even though his work on general relativity, black holes, and singularities in the 1970s and 1980s was truly Nobel-worthy. The primary distinction in predictions is that the CCC essentially mandates the presence of remnants from the universe before the Big Bang in the cosmic microwave background and the large-scale structure of the universe. On the other hand, inflation dictates that any place where inflation terminates and a hot Big Bang occurs must be causally separate from and unable to interact with any such region in the past, present, or future. There is a real universe out there with its own unique set of characteristics. As far as we can tell, any such structures are severely limited by the observations, which came first from Kobe and W. Mapp, and then from Planck. In our universe, you won't find any bruises, patterns, concentric circles of erratic fluctuations or hawking points. After a thorough examination of the facts, it becomes abundantly evident that inflation fits the data while the CCC plainly does not. Almost 10 years ago, Roger Penrose made some rather questionable assertions about the universe, showing signs of features like low temperature variance concentric circles that result from dynamics imprinted before the Big Bang. Inadequate and lacking in robustness, these features do not lend credence to Penrose's claims. The evidence is strongly against Penrose's claims, even though he isn't alone in making them, just like Hoyle. The data disproves his predictions, and his assertions that these effects may be replicated require an analysis of the data that is both scientifically flawed and unethical. Penrose has ignored the field and pressed on with his claims, despite hundreds of scientists pointing this out to him over the course of more than a decade. There has never been a more massive and contentious cosmic dispute than the Hubble tension. The fact that stars and galaxies are clearly expanding from our perspective over time makes scientists aware that the universe is expanding in all directions, but they still can't precisely determine the rate at which this expansion is occurring. A shocking finding from the late 1990s by astronomers suggested that the acceleration of the rate could be a result of dark energy. As a result, our current cosmic comprehension is severely lacking. The James Webb Space Telescope was brought into the picture for the first time by researchers in an effort to understand more about this, but their efforts were in vain. A thickening effect was actually achieved using JWST. A definitive resolution of the Hubble tension hinges on finding the real value of the Hubble constant, an essential parameter for the calculation of the rate of expansion of the cosmos. However, it seems that our theoretical predictions of the constant do not align with reality, for some reason. There are two possible interpretations of this disparity. Either our instruments aren't smart enough, or our theoretical forecast was completely incorrect. So maybe we're overlooking something in the models that are now guiding our knowledge of the cosmos. Getting back to the results, 
the JWST accomplished yet another goal with its space-based observatory. To sum up, it proved that the so-called problem is likely not related to concerns with the Hubble Space Telescope's observations, which is its more famous brother. Importantly, astronomers often rely on Hubble observations, and more especially, Hubble observations of Cepheid stars, to decipher the Hubble constant. Thus, this is a major development. The most compelling proof that the current Hubble tension is not due to systematic mistakes in Hubble's Cepheid photometry is provided by Webb's observations. Because of its remarkable accuracy in measuring star brightness, Hubble is an essential tool for resolving Hubble tension. That's because, unlike ground-based observatories, it sits above Earth's murky atmosphere, which makes it easier to see through. We may use these brightnesses to calculate the distance to the stars, and using the constant speed of light as a reference, the time it has taken for light to reach us. Scientists have reasoned that this type of data collected from a large number of stars should allow us to determine the Hubble constant based on their calculations. Astronomers weren't sure if the cosmos had been expanding for 10 or 20 billion years before Hubble's launch in 1990 due to the uncertainty of the expansion rate. Additionally, astronomers like to use Hubble to zero in on the Cepheids as a specific target in order to determine the rate of expansion of the universe. The brightness of these supergiant stars is around 100,000 times that of our Sun. They are the most reliable method for determining the Hubble constant, which requires measuring the distances of galaxies 100 million light years or farther out. The fact that Cepheids pulsate, or change size, is an indication of their relative luminosities, as pointed out by Rees. He went on to say that it's beneficial to have longer periods since they give baseline brightnesses and, in the end, more accurate readings, as they are naturally brighter. Therefore, the telescope can measure the time interval over which these galaxies alter their brightness because Hubble is perched above our atmosphere and can identify individual Cepheids in galaxies more than 100 million light years away. However, Hubble does have its limits. It's not sensitive enough to detect infrared light, which is beyond the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and is therefore unseen by humans. First of all, light traveling from afar sources become stretched out on its approach to our vantage point on Earth. Therefore, infrared vision is crucial while staring at distant objects. Longer crimson wavelengths emerge from once tight bluish ones. That is the origin of the term red-shifted galaxies, which describes dimensionalities that are, from Earth's vantage point, falling more and farther towards the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Secondly, since only infrared light can penetrate dust without being affected, it follows that a Cepheid encased in a veil of interstellar matter would seem less prominent to our naked eye. That could lead to problems, such as the star's light mixing with that of nearby Cepheids, or giving the impression that a star is further away than it actually is. Statistically, we may take into consideration the typical degree of mixing in the same manner that a doctor would determine your weight by removing the typical quantity of clothing from the measurement taken by the scale. Nevertheless, this introduces additional measurement noise. Clothes weigh more on some people than on others. Then step right up the James Webb Space Telescope. The team states that to begin, they had to calibrate their observations by looking for Cepheids in a galaxy at a given geometric distance. Galaxy 4258 was the name of that particular one. Step two involved verifying Hubble's findings by looking for Cepheids in the galaxies that had recently experienced Type Ia supernovae, bright stellar explosions. Perhaps now we know for sure why there is a discrepancy if Hubble was incorrect. However, Hubble was correct in his observations. JWST has effectively put an end to that question. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.